and cloudy and terrible, or some people are very disappointed when you're there and suddenly it's a flat sea and it's just like being in a pond uh, uh, somewhere back home. I don't know what the weather is, but so far, just the fact we had sunshine today, I think, is a, a good sign, a good omen. Well, anyway, today I'm going to talk about some of these ports where we're going, give you a little bit more background about Chile. Uh, Dr. Dachi, they talked about some of the uh, political affairs and the economy of this area, which has really turned around quite a bit, making it a, um, an easier place to visit than it was a few decades ago. Uh, of course, now we're going down by sea in an area that there's very difficult to get by land, and so this is a, a great way to see the rest of this vast country. Now, I'll show you my, my various pictures. This is actually a, a, a port in Anafagosta, which is up in the north coast of Chile. And Chile, of course, is this uh, vast, long country that uh, stretches the entire way down, and it's, um, it's the uh, longest and most narrow nation on Earth with uh, great deserts up here in the, uh, the north. And then as the further you go down, it gets to be a um, temperate rainforest. And that's where the fjords are, where we're going. Most of the population, of course, is in the, the center. We were, most of us came into Santiago, came over to Valparaiso. And then there are the other territories of um, Chile, which are the uh, Juan Fernandez Islands right here, which are just offshore of uh, Valparaiso. That's famously where the setting of Robinson Crusoe was. And then there's the other island of uh, Easter Island, Rapa Nui, which is Chilean territory uh, since about 100 years ago. And they consider this whole ocean of the South Pacific on the east end of it to be their uh, territory. And that's why this nation, which is very maritime oriented, has a fairly extensive navy and a very strong maritime tradition. Now, those of you have all been up to Norway and perhaps Alaska and these other great fjord lands like uh, New Zealand, but, but Chile by far has the most of all, perhaps, of this kind of fjord land and then a very extensive coast. And of course, we're going to come down to Puerto Montt and then go down through the Chonos Archipelago around in Punta Arenas and then go through the Straits of Magellan, not around Cape Horn, which is another couple of days' trip, and then we'll go off to the Falklands and up into Argentina. Now. You all came into this um, capital, Santiago, which is a uh, booming city. And I can remember it about 25 years ago, and it seemed pleasant and not that crowded. But now with this booming economy, it's becoming uh, something uh, like a Los Angeles with uh, mountains around it holding in air pollution and then containing the city. Uh, so that this is very much the center of the whole country. Maybe some of you spent some time there, but that's not the maritime. That's really the industrial center and, of course, the center of the great agricultural uh, central valleys of central Chile. And uh, if you went down to the Plaza de Armas, you have your classical Spanish colonial center with some office buildings. And then this tradition that has been a difficult heritage for Chile in that uh, when it was founded by the conquistadores, the Spanish colonists came down from Peru. This is uh, Valdivia, who led the army by horseback coming over the deserts and coming down and finding this lush area of central Chile and set up the first estancias in the Spanish colony here. Now, this um, was at really at the end of the world back then, as you can appreciate. Uh, those who came this far often never got home. And then they settled and set up the kind of agriculture that was common elsewhere. But they started to have immigrants like this fellow, uh, Bernard O'Higgins. Uh, his parents were Irish settlers who came in the early colonial times, about uh, 1750. And then he, as a young man, joined the, um, the uprisings against the Spanish crown and led an uh, uh, army of Chileans against what they call the loyalists to the Spanish crown. And this was back in the days of uh, the Napoleonic uh, Wars. Had, had, um, Napoleon had invaded, invaded Spain and upset the whole empire, and then that led to the independence of all these American Spanish colonies. Now, O'Higgins, though, was a dynamic uh, patriot, and he and his colleagues declared independence in 1818, and then fought for many years with the remnants of the Spanish rule. Now, this led to a battle of where we're going now at, at uh, Cachabuco in 1818, where the Spanish loyalist army was surrounded by O'Higgins, even though he was, had fewer soldiers, he did conquer the Spanish there and then establish the independence. So, ironically, it took an Irishman to make uh, uh, Chile free 
But then the Spanish Navy came down from Peru and they were still trying to come back and attack. And it was the British or Scottish originally, Admiral Thomas Cochran, who then led the Chilean Navy to de defeat the Spanish at the Battle of Valdivia that then kept the Spanish away uh, uh, at bay for the rest of the time and now of course Chile like the rest of South America have been independent. Now I, I went just yesterday in Valparaiso to the Naval Museum which was up on the hill above the dock area and I was just interested to see what they have. Of course this is a, uh, a, a, an active naval base but it has the uh, heritage of the the Navy of Chile here. Uh, particularly I, I like their, their putting green in the center in the shape of an anchor. Uh, but inside they have all these different displays and photos. And then the, the overlook is down to the uh, harbor. Now that's our ship right there. Uh, <clears throat> and as you would, I don't think anybody had time to stay in, in Valparaiso, but it, it's a very interesting port because it is this amphitheater of little houses crawling up the hills. And uh, it was always the most important port, port of Chile. Uh, and to this day still is the major naval base and access into the major industrial areas of Santiago. That's why it's such a busy port. It's somewhat difficult because, of course, the container shipping has taken over the waterfront. And as you found out, the terminal and all of the access to our own ship was not that easy yesterday. For instance, you couldn't walk from our ship into the center of town without going on the bus and such. So it's not exactly up to, I'd say, international cruise port standards. And the town itself, I, I was surprised, is getting more and more run down as the years go by, mainly because the suburbanization and also the wealthy of, 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 of Chile don't like Valparaiso. It was famous as kind of a surly port that it was dangerous for sailors to go out at night. That's why I don't ever spend a night there. But um, I walked around the town just the other day and you could see with some half of it is falling down, the rest of it is a traffic jam and, and a lot of the beautiful buildings are being run down and there's still a lot of very poor people in Chile. Now, Dr. Dutchie talked about the prosperity of Chile in the last number of years based on copper and now maybe lithium and, of course, its agricultural produ production of wine and things like that have made for a f the most prosperous country of South America. But nonetheless, there's still a lot of poor people, and you see them in Valparaiso. Um, this guy was selling pineapples. And, uh, and the, the, on the other hand, there's a whole prosperous area outside of Valparaiso, which is not in the port. Now, as we were leaving, you could see this area up here, these sort of these sand dunes, and over them are rising the um, resort uh, towers of uh, Viña del Mar. And if you ever were up in that area, it is sort of the, the Miami beach of Chile. So the people from the big cities and the inner areas come to Viña to vacation. And so the further you go up there, the fancier it gets. Here's some of the, what I call the Great Wall of Leisure that is being built along the coast. Um, and uh, it's not really a port up there. There's, it's mostly recreational in Valpo. Valparaiso is the port. Now I happen to have, a, I sent my own son, this is my son Adrian. He, he came to, sent him to Chile for a high school exchange program for a whole term of high school. And he moved into Valparaiso and ended up going to the Scuola Italiano di Valparaiso where they taught in Italian. And this is an example of Chile is actually a mixed ethnically nation with many Italians, Germans, Austrians, French, all kinds of people, Welsh, that have come to this part of South America. But uh, he was there and ended up uh, staying in Valparaiso with an Italian-speaking family. And then the school vacation from Chile went to Italy for their vacation. So we said, why do we send him to Chile to learn Italian? But maybe if we would send him to Italy, he would have learned Spanish better. I don't know. Now, now he's in Japan studying. But anyway, he, he had a very good time because he was taken around in Viña and Valpo where there are all these um, estates of the former, let's say, um, uh, feudal lords of the town. This is one that's preserved as a museum right on the, on the shore at Viña. And it's very much in contrast to the poor working areas of Valparaiso. And you'll see this in all the Chilean towns that we're going to go to is that there's still, uh, let's say, a fairly simple and humble life for most, most people, but there's a lot of wealth that has been generated over the generations in, in Chile. Now this, I'm going to give you a little uh, just background for the country a bit more, just that the political problems of Chile have been very severe because of uh, the competition between the immigrant groups with the native peoples, who I'll speak about another day, and then um, socialist parties, workers' unions, and then the conservative countryside landowners 
and then the industrial and mining interests. So this led to the troubles of the 1960s and 70s. So when Salvador Allende was elected and declared that Chile would become a Marxist socialist nation with the backing of the Soviet Union and friends with Castro, such this led to a sharpening of divisions in the society with a lot of strikes and then riots. And finally, the coup d'etat that put Pinochet in as the uh, restoration of uh, the oligarchy. And I, I'll spare you the details, except that it was a very cruel time. They bombed the presidential palace, and they said that Allende committed suicide, but he was probably just sh murdered in the um, attack of the coup d'etat. And then they rounded up so many of the students and so many people, and then there were a lot of uh, people killed, and uh, desparecidos that disappeared that is still a pain to these days. So Pinochet uh, ended up being, you know, indicted in Spain, and he finally uh, passed away before he ended up in the court of justice in, in Madrid or even in Chile. But in Chile, they've tried very much to moderate his heritage along with, let's say, the, the very strong socialist and communist influence that was going on in this country. But still, I know I know I have friends in, in Chile whose kids were disappeared. They rounded up at university and were, what they used to do, put them in airplanes and throw them in the ocean. And this is uh, just the tragedy of the country. But in the last number of uh, decades, there's been a considerable, let's say, moderation of all these troubles, especially when they had the former president, um, um, Bachelet, who uh, was a, a doctor, the daughter of a army general. She was a minister of defense, and then she became president. And uh, as uh, Dr. Dodacci said, she had three kids by two men, but was never married and also was an agnostic and not a Catholic and was the first woman president in South America and quite a transformative person in Chile because she, as it says there, uh, she's asking all of the uh, parliamentarians to work together for the cause of unity in this country. And it's very much worked out that the country has become much more prosperous and it's moderated its radical ends of its society and then worked together to make Chile a functional society, especially economically. But you'll see on the streets like this, there's still a lot of sort of agitation and some, um, uh, it's pretty, particularly Valparaiso, it's pretty dirty. I don't know who they were drawing there. I don't think that's Bachelet. But uh, here's a poster that was up yesterday in Valparaiso, which is the Communist Party of Chile, which is still one of the opposition parties, but it doesn't really hold much uh, power or sway in the society, which is becoming more prosperous and more cooperative. Now, I'm, uh, but the country sometimes has the trouble at hand. This is the, uh, the uh, Cabrineri that are in Valparaiso in case there's some sort of problem in the city. Now, much of South America has become a lot more peaceful in the last couple of decades, but uh, Chile, above all, has become a, a, a peaceful country, and we are going down into the more peaceful parts of it. So here we've left central Chile where the cities and the troubles generally are. We're down into the Lake District, which is up here. We're going to be coming around uh, in the uh, channel of Cacao and then up to Puerto Montt and then the next few days visiting this lake country right up in here and then continuing down in the great archipelago and around down to Puerto, uh, Punta Arenas. Now this, this area of course is the object of our cruise and uh, like much of Chile it's sort of like a, a big snake that has these different provinces with their own distinct qualities and here we are in Puerto Montt and the island of Chiloa. Now this is an area that is pretty rugged on the continental side, but these uh, sweeping big islands out here. We just passed one just about an hour ago. You could see the scale of the land that we're going into. And um, we will go up into Puerto Montt, up in here, which is the southern port in the Lake District. Now this is not a big city. There's none of, the, none of this area of Chile has a large population. The town may have about 50,000 people in it, but it's mostly access into the agricultural areas, into the recreational uh, areas in the um, national parks that are all through this area. There's an American who's been, uh, by name of Havilland, has been buying up a lot of land and giving it to the Chilean Park Service just to try to preserve some of the uh, ancient forests and some of the wildlife. And so it's often taken the, some foreigner to come in and actually give the land to the public to make it possible. And he's bought up a lot of land on, the, on this side of Chile and then over around in here, around Puerto Montt. Now, we will be landing, anchoring out, and then landing at this um, uh, Anselmo dock. There is no deep water dock for the ship in the town of Puerto Montt. So therefore, we have to go ashore by tender. And you can see this is a town that has 
um, low buildings and not much architectural distinction and no great landmarks, but it's very pleasant, has a great walkway across the Great Bay. Um, we will go into town, those of us who are on our own, otherwise most people will go out on one of the tours, as you've learned about, up to the lakes and up to the rivers and some of the estancias and other scenic attractions of the area. Puerto Montt itself is not that attractive a town. It has its standard Plaza de Animas, some statues, some anchors, and the sort of thing that are typical of a port town. And it also has a fine Scottish restaurant right there. That's uh, actually some of my ancestors used to be chefs in that uh, uh, chain and so it like a lot of Chile though uh, it suddenly uh, has a lot of cars and a lot of uh, people visiting there's a great deal of internal uh, tourism from other parts of Chile here and then of course all the international visitors that are coming and this couple I think they ate too much at that Scottish restaurant they got a little too big I don't know if this statue is still there it's right on the waterfront in uh, Puerto Montt and of course like all young couples what do they want to do they want to go on a cruise, and I think that's the only ship big enough to hold them. But um, nonetheless, uh, you'll be greeted at the dock by some uh, Mapuche people. This is in the area of the native Mapuche people, um, and then, of course, a llama from the mountains. Now, we're getting, of course, in the southern Andes, and so the, the, uh, it's quite different than Peru and up in the uh, central Andes area, but if you can feel that the mountain culture is right down there on the sea. In the older parts of town, they have a lot of buildings that were kind of tossed up by the original German immigrants and are not in great condition. This is a very wet and uh, uh, cool part of the world, and so some of this architecture doesn't hold up well unless it was built well. But you can walk around in some of the, the neighborhoods and find beautiful real estate opportunities like this. And uh, in case you want to invest in real estate, you should buy it now before the price goes down again. But uh, it's a kind of a rundown town that way. It's not quite as, uh, as fancy as Santiago, certainly. But it does have these markets. Um, Lander was saying if you go out from the town and nearby uh, to the south of the landing where the uh, tenders take us, there is a fish market and a food market. And these, again, are mostly run by uh, Mapuche people coming in from the countryside, bringing in the products. Uh, see the size of those carrots? That's uh, this sort of southern uh, summertime crops are actually very big, sort of like Alaska. Things grow very fast and large down here. And so this is a sort of not a very attractive um, area for walking. It's a rough market, but it is native. Now then we're going to continue on down from Puerto Montt here through the uh, Gulf of uh, Ancud. And then the, there's a lot of uh, little islands around in here. And then we'll go all the way down to Cachabungo. Now this is a, a very big island. Chiloé is a, kind of a famous island because it had a native people that, I'll, again, before they're now gone, I'll talk about them some another time. But this was an area that was settled and deforested quite a while ago, and a lot of sheep ranches and farms were set up. And here's a picture of uh, Puerto Montt back in the olden days when this was sort of as far as um, settlers went. Anywhere south of here, the land gets too rough and actually too wet to, for agriculture. It's good for fishing and some things. But uh, here's the current city that's on uh, Chiloé Island called Ancud, and it's uh, part of the vast uh, inland that this island has. Uh, back when the Chilean government was fighting the Mapuche people, they had to build forts down here to protect the uh, European immigrants that were coming in and taking the land. So there's still some of those recreated on Chiloé Island and around in the Lake District. Uh, also kind of rustic uh, churches from those times. This is uh, sort of the, not the wild west, but the wild south of Chile. And you have settlers that are living still fairly, or agricultural people living fairly simple life on these islands and on this edge of Chile that, that have, a, they have a very lush uh, summertime, but a very long, dark winter. So they have uh, typically a multiple of employment here. They're beekeeping and collecting honey. Uh, this is too far south and too wet for wine country, though. And so it's, uh, it's fairly poor, this area. Their main product, though, is, of course, uh, cattle and then sheep, especially. And so Chiloé uh, has some of these big uh, crofters' buildings that are left. This is one that's been turned into a hotel on the island. And so some of this is preserved, most of the, the uh, Sheep manufacturing or, or uh, shearing is done in larger factories inland now. But one of the things they do make down here, you'll see in the markets of Puerto Montt and the others, 
as we go along are a lot of woolen goods, uh, sometimes of sheep wool, other times of the cunha and other uh, native animals. On this island of Chiloé, they have these kind of staved churches. It almost looks like a bit of Norway, the way that they're put up. And of course, they're Catholic. Now, there's some uh, evangelicals here. Uh, and then there's some, again, native Mapuche shamanist practices. But most people are Catholic. And so you have uh, the typical village procession. This is all very small scale compared to what goes on in larger countries or in Europe especially. But the Chileans are especially um, uh, fervent about, first of all, their, their nation. Uh, they're very proud to be Chilean. And that uh, the next religion is football. And then after that is the church. Um, but uh, here's a, in, in Ch uh, Chiloé is a, a procession with one of the um, churches. But it, unlike other countries, they'll always carry their flags. And then they have a blessing out on the lawn of some young girls. I don't, I don't know actually what the ceremony is, but they are carrying effigy of Jesus. This is an Easter procession at some time. But uh, the, 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 Ch the Chileans are, um, um, well, as uh, Dr. Dachi said, they're very serious, but they're very loving. And one thing I've noted in my times in Chile and with the Chilean family that had taken in my own son is how affectionate and close they are with each other. And so you have a lot of uh, community spirit uh, in all very, very small places. Um, and maybe just because Ch Chile was so far away from the rest of the world, there were so few people that they, they have a tradition of, let's say, strong family bonds and also care for strangers. And they consider the North to be cold and not so kind. So here's some people singing off of um, Chiloé, some local folk music. Now, so many are going on that excursion to the Lake District, which is north of Puerto Mol. And there's some beautiful big lakes, um, many, many places to go see. And you, you, you've heard that from the tour office. But this area is the beginning of all these great fjords with ice fields, especially up in the, uh, the Andean range. And so as you go inland to the east from the bays and what they call canales, the channels of the fjordland, you start to see the snow-capped peaks. And then you go up into the lagos or the freshwater lakes. Sometimes it's confusing because they'll call a laguna is actually a tidal lake that is connected to the sea, but it has a lot of fresh water in it. And that's where they take excursions up um, into the mountains and also have horseback riding. This is called a huequi, which is across and just south of uh, Puerto Montt. Um, and this is sort of backpacker country and um, horseback, kayaking, rafting. Uh, who's going on the rafting trip tomorrow? Oh, good. Well, <laughs> be sure to wear your woolies. But uh, there's a, it's a, this is sort of like going in hiking in Alaska and such. And it's a, a great experience wherever you go. But in, in Chile, it is particularly dramatic because you really think you're the first people that go into some of these places. Of course, you're not. but. And there are not that many natives living in the back country anymore. They've mostly resettled in, into, the, into the cities by various forces. I'll talk about that another day. But it is a, a great natural playground. And they still have active volcanoes. Uh, this is Hui Chi volcano. There's the other one, uh, Chai Ten, which just erupted a couple of years ago. So it's still uh, geologically very dramatic around here, uh, and sometimes very dangerous. Uh, there was also that great earthquake up near Concepcion, north of here, that 8.8 .8 Richter scale. That, that devastated that city. And so we, we uh, Silver Seas, of course, arranged that there are no natural disasters during the duration of our cruise. And if so, we're offshore sh anyway. But uh, here's one of the lakes up in the area. So you have snow-capped peaks, glaciers coming down, the great uh, spine of the Andes coming down, and then these beautiful freshwater lakes. Now, it doesn't really freeze here. In fact, it doesn't really get that cold. This is a um, curiously moderate temperature down here most of the time. Um, it's just a matter of the Pacific being nearby this area. So it doesn't really have that uh, on the coast, the kind of ice fields that are up on the top of the mountains. But there's a lot of water runoff, fresh water that comes down, fills these basins, and then these great rivers that come down. Uh, this is where they're also building a lot of now uh, hydroelectric plants and other development in this area. Uh, there's a controversy in Chile now about a high power transmission line from the Bio Bio River area all the way up to Santiago because the central Chilean cities and industry are booming and they need more electricity and they're taking it now out of the mountains here uh, as they can build the projects. But otherwise it's a playground for kayaking and some people are going horseback riding I think or maybe you'd like to try this if, uh, if you haven't had enough to drink on board you can drink the river here. 
Now, I actually went and did that in my kayak. We were up in the, in the Futafuta River many years ago, and it's just a vast area. You can get, you, if you're not careful, you get completely lost. Then we're going to go through the Moraleda Channel and then go out to sea and then back into this, the further southern area to go down into San Rafael. Now, this is called the Laguna or a lagoon. It's an arm of the sea where we will cruise down in, and then this is near the North Patagonian ice field. And so this is a day where we don't actually go um, ashore, but we go up into the glaciers. And this is a great attraction that you can see by ship. If you come here um, on your own, you can go on lo little local boats, but it takes quite a while to get to these places because of the scale of this region. But we go down into this area south of uh, Puerto Chacabuco. Uh, some people may go up into the, the um, Rio Stanley there. These are all scenic wonders of this area. So I, I, I don't need to take your interest away from your own photography, but there's just a few scenes of how the ocean comes to the mountains and there's a, there's a very palpable sense of uh, geographic drama here. And uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's kind of a place that if you had your own private boat, you could probably just cruise around here for years and never see the same thing twice. So as, as we go up to Laguna, um, San Rafael will take all of these turns and come toward the uh, great glaciers. And there's a, many of them around that are coming off the north ice field, which is well, well high in the mountains. You usually can't see it. But now they come down and they, uh, they have what's called a, a tidal glacier where the, the ice has been pushed out and it's floating on the sea. And uh, it's described that some of these glaciers are both uh, advancing and retreating at the same time because the ice field is pushing them down. They, they calve off and then they retreat back, but now they are generally receding through the warming of the climate in general, but that means the ice is moving quicker, so as it gets warmer, there's more ice out. And that's sort of one of those curious contradictions of uh, our times. Similarly, in Greenland, it's melting, but that means there are more icebergs breaking off. Uh, but we'll come up like this, and then if we're lucky, we will get really close. Now, if you, if you um, haven't had enough fun uh, on board, you can um, get close and get, uh, get wet this way, or you can uh, get your boots on and try this. They have hikes on the glaciers, and if you really want to, you can go ice caving, which I prefer my ice in a glass, but uh, that's the sort of thing that people come down here to do. We have a, a, a little taste of it. But this whole area has a, um, uh, a sort of a mythic quality to it, and this was best uh, described by the great poet Pablo Neruda, uh, who was a a diplomat in the Foreign Service of Chile and lived on Isla Negra, which is near uh, Chiloe in this area south of Puerto Montt. He had his private house and he was a very prolific poet, wrote about many different things. You may know his, his poem, um, The Heights of Machu Picchu, and he was sort of a, he described a lot of the natural life and then also personal feelings and was somewhat a naturalistic poet who became a national figure. Um, and was a very vocal supporter of Allende, even though he was not as socialist or Marxist as Allende was. But when the coup d'etat happened, he retreated to his house in Isla Negra, where there's now a monument to him, and he thought he would be hunted down and arrested and probably um, executed for his writings and such. And so, fortunately, took his own life there at the house on Isla Negra. But I'm going to read you a poem of his um, called Desconocidos, in La Orilla, which is Strangers on the Shore. And it just captures some of the feeling that you can sense in this very dramatic part of the world in Chile. So he goes, I have come back home, and still the sea keeps sending me strange foam. It does not get used to the way I see. The sand does not b recognize me. It makes no sense to return to the ocean without warning. It does not know you return, or even that you are away. And the water is so busy with all its blue business that arrivals go unrealized. The waves keep up their song, and although the sea has many hands, many mouths, and many kisses, no hand reaches out to you, no mouth kisses you, and you soon must realize what a feeble thing you are. And now I feel we are friends. We come back with open arms, and here is the sea dancing away not bothering with us. I will have to wait for the fog, the flying salt, the scattered sun, for the sea to breathe and breathe on me. Because the water is not just water, but a hazy intrusion. 
and all the waves roll in the air like invisible horses. And so I have to learn to swim within my dreams in case the sea should come to visit me in my sleep. And if that happens, fair enough. And when tomorrow stirs on the wet stones, the sand and the great resounding sway of the sea will know who I am and why I return will accept me into its school. And I can be content again in the solitude of the sand, graduated by the wind and respected by the world of the sea. So Pablo Neruda captured a certain sense that the Chileans feel about their country and also especially about this great coast that we are visiting. And I hope that you can feel that when we're out there. And I look forward to getting to meet you more individually and being out in this wonderful country with you. Thank you very much. Here we are.